Hi, I'm Matt Davids from Dana-Farber. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Lindsay Roker from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we're here to discuss some of the highlights from the 2022 ASH meeting in CLL. So Lindsay, this morning you co-moderated a session that was focused on doublet therapies with abrutinib plus venetoclax, two very important drugs in CLL. There were actually six abstracts presented with this doublet, so clearly an important regimen. So what were some of the takeaways from this session for you? This morning we really saw a lot of um, longer term follow-up on studies that we've seen before. So we saw further follow-up on both Captivate and GLOW, so Captivate being a phase two study. And today's focus was really on that um, population who had achieved undetectable MRD, looking at those who received either placebo or ivrutinib, and we see that both uh, sets of patients are doing extraordinarily well. We saw longer term follow up data from I plus V um, in, the, uh, in a study from MD Anderson. Dr. Jane presented that this morning and saw that there's really long term efficacy with this, um, with this regimen. And then we also learned more about uh, unmutated versus mutated IGHV and how that plays into responses for patients treated with this combination. And then finally, we saw an add-on approach. So patients who had received ibrutinib um, in clinical practice and then had venetoclax added to the regimen and really proving that you can consolidate um, responses and then have treatment-free observation periods with durable response after discontinuing therapy. So a lot of data coming out of this and um, I think really seeing that I plus V is going to be a, a future um, very important player in, um, in CLL and still really figuring out exactly how it fits in and for whom we should be using it. And I think just to highlight that last abstract in particular, with, with Dr. Thompson's data now, we have a lot of patients out there who are on abrutinib as a, a monotherapy continuous treatment, and a lot of them would like to come off drugs. So I guess based on these data, do you feel more comfortable with the strategy of adding in venetoclax to get patients off abrutinib? Yeah, I mean, these data look great. So I think we're seeing that there is the possibility of taking patients on BTK inhibitors who are not achieving deep responses just by mechanism of BTK inhibitors, but by adding venetoclax, we're able to achieve deeper responses and patients are able to come off of, of these drugs. So obviously not a standard of care yet, but I think it's it's going to be a, a future option for our patients who are on these monotherapies and a lot do experience some form of toxicity or um, some side effect that, you know, there is a goal to get off, off treatment. And then beyond I plus V, we're also going to see data presented at this meeting on triplet therapy. So can you tell us a bit about that? So triplets are sort of building on the I plus V type of experience with a BTK inhibitor, BCL2 inhibitor, and, and adding an antibody, and, and typically obinutuzumab is the antibody. So there's a session with actually two different studies. So one is looking at the IVO triplet with abrutinib, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. This is a study that focused exclusively on patients with high-risk disease, deletion 17P or TP53 mutation. And even despite the fact that these were high-risk patients, they saw high rates of undetectable MRD, high rate of complete remission, uh, and the durability seems good so far. I think one of the challenges, though, as we think about rolling that out to a larger patient population is there are some of the typical abrutinib side effects, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, some infectious complications. Uh, so in the same session, we're actually presenting data from our AVO triplet study with acalabrutinib, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. Similarly, we're seeing high rates of undetectable MRD and complete remission, but I do think the tolerability seems better, as we've seen from head-to-head -head studies comparing abrutinib with acalabrutinib. And so hopefully that's the type of regimen we could potentially in the future roll out to larger numbers of patients, even those who are older and, and with comorbidities. So not practice changing yet. Uh, there's a phase three study with AVO that would need to read out first and, and show that that's superior to the current standards of care. Uh, but we're certainly optimistic about the data based on our phase two experience. Fabulous. And do you see, um, is the combination of acalabrutinib and venetoclax also being explored? Because we obviously saw a ton of data on I plus V. Yeah, exactly. So there are a number of studies underway looking at acalabrutinib and venetoclax as a doublet. We haven't really seen much in the way of data presented yet. Um, the study I just referred to of AVO versus chemo immunotherapy also has an AV doublet arm. So that's the Amplify study, and, and hopefully we'll read out relatively soon, and that's going to be an important data set. The other study that we're very excited about that I know you have open at Memorial as well is called the MAGIC study, and that's looking at an all-comer population in the frontline setting, comparing acalabrutinib and venetoclax to venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, with both arms being guided by MRD in terms of therapy duration. So I think eventually we'll have a lot more AV data, and I think that's also a promising doublet. Exciting upcoming data for sure. Yeah. The other um, abstract that I think we're all really excited to see is the Alpine study. So could you tell us a little bit 
bit about that and, and kind of how that you see that informing your practice? Yeah, so Alpine is a study in the relapse setting comparing patients treated with continuous xanabrutinib, a newer, more selective BTK inhibitor, compared to ibrutinib, uh, kind of traditionally been the standard of care over the last few years. Uh, we had seen some early data from the Alpine study readout last year, uh, which did look promising, but it was very immature at that time. So I think we're very excited at the late-breaking abstract session here at ASH to see the updated data with longer follow-up from Alpine. And in addition to seeing improvements in the safety profile of xanabrutinib compared to ibrutinib, we also see now a PFS benefit that seems to be maintained with, I think, close to 30 months of follow-up based on the abstract. Um, and so that's pretty intriguing to see a PFS benefit in this in this setting. I, I don't know. What do you make of that? Do you think that that's going to be practice changing? I, I think it's going to be a really exciting um, change because it's the first time we've actually seen a covalent BTK inhibitor outperform another covalent BTK inhibitor. In the study um, of acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib, the hazard ratio for progression-free survival is 1.00. So efficacy is completely similar for those two agents. So I think it is going to be interesting to see um, see those data. And I think that xanabrutinib, obviously not yet FDA approved for CLL, but um, probably is going to have an increasing role in the treatment of, of CLL. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think for me, the Alpine study is pretty convincing if I was considering a brutinib versus xanabrutinib that I'd want to choose xanabrutinib. I think the tougher challenge is xanabrutinib versus acalabrutinib because yep. we don't have a head-to-head -head comparison there. We're looking across different studies that were done at different times with different methodologies. So I think that's going to be an ongoing And different follow-up. So exactly. I think we're yeah. also going to see with, with more time what happens with Alpine and how the toxicity profile evolves over time as well. Yeah, great point. I think those are some of our key, key takeaways from CLL at ASH 2022. We hope you enjoyed watching this video. Thank you very much.